Friends, dying, Christ destroyed our death and rising, Christ restored our life. Christ will come again in glory. As in baptism, Ed put on Christ, and so in Christ may Ed be clothed with glory. Here and now, dear friends, we are God's children. What we shall be has not yet been revealed, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Those who have this hope purify themselves as Christ is pure. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet shall they live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death because I live you shall live also. Friends, it is a good and joyful day to be able to welcome you here to Wrightsboro United Methodist Church. For those that I haven't had the opportunity to meet, my name is Angelo. I have the honor of serving as the pastor here, and I'm here today with my friend and colleague, David Hollowell, who served this church as pastor um, for five and a half years and is also a dear friend of our beloved Ed. We gather here today to praise God. Sometimes that sounds odd when we're gathered for a time to grieve and mourn, but we do indeed today praise God and we witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of Ed Wren. We come together in grief and we acknowledge our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. Good morning, friends. I invite you to pray with me. O oh God, who gave us birth, you are ever more ready to hear than we are to pray. You know our needs before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Give to us now your grace, that as we shrink before the mystery of death, we may see the light of eternity. Speak to us once more your solemn message of life and of death, Help us to live as those who are prepared to die. And when our days here are accomplished, enable us to die as those who go forth to live, so that living or dying, our life may be in you, and that nothing in life or in death will be able to separate us from your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand and sing together one of Ed's favorite hymns, How Great Thou Art. The words will be on the screen. See 
Please be seated. For thousands of years, the people of God have found comfort, strength, and peace in the Word of God that we have come to know as the 23rd Psalm. It is printed on the back of your bulletin, and I would invite us to read this beautiful psalm together in unison. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. We come to the section of our service that we call a time of reflection, a time when we reflect upon the life of Ed Wren, memories of events with him and just the, the things that uh, made him special to us. And we're going to start off this time of reflection with a video from Pastor Bill Haddock. Greetings in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I use that phrase from St. Paul almost every week when I sent out a letter to the congregation that I entitled TGIF, Thank God It's Friday. It was on a Sunday after I sent that out that Ed Reen had started using that expression a lot when he would see me. And we would see each other a lot. We had Tuesday morning Bible study and breakfast together over at Ruth's Kitchen. We had a weekly appointment to help out with warm projects. And of course, I saw him at Sunday school and the early church uh, worship service that we had every Sunday. He and Velna were always around and were connected by love for each other and for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know that they are both rejoicing in heaven today. At the same time, there's going to be a real gap in all of our lives because Ed was such a generous person with his love and his care and his kindness. And we're going to miss that. I want to tell you something about Ed. He taught me so many things. The first time I met Ed out on a work site, we had uh, to cut and measure and put a board up so that it would be level. And I say we did, had to do that, but I was mainly just holding the board and holding the level as I am now. And uh, we never could get it exactly straight. I, I knew what it meant to be on the level. And every now and then, uh, Ed would say, no, go up, go down, go up, turn to the side, stand on your head, do something, make this thing level. And finally, we got it level and he looked at me and said, well, I reckon that's going to be good enough for government work. He used that phrase a lot. Um, but I was always amazed that he could find a little bit of humor in the midst of even some trying times. Uh, yes, uh, I agree with Ed. Uh, probably 98% of the time, I mean, Ed and Velna were the kind of people that any pastor or any church would love to have in their fellowship. They were just so supportive, so understanding, and uh, they just loved uh, people. Well, 
On the work site, I also learned something else. So many things that Ed taught me. He taught me how to wear suspenders properly. I needed that. He taught me how to use good tools. And every time I saw some of his good tools, I would go out to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy me tools uh, to match that, even if I didn't use them. Uh, at least I had good tools. And when I thought about uh, Ed's life and the impact it made upon me, I thought about the other kinds of tools that he shared with me, which are so, more so much more important. The tools of just being gracious and kind to all people. The tools of going out of your way to make sure that people knew that they were loved. The tools of arriving early and staying late and doing whatever it needed to be done to accomplish a task. And most importantly, the tools of being in love with one's family and with the family of God. Yes, I'm going to miss Ed Wren. And Ed and I have worked a lot with Leon West and it just so happened that Ed and Leon died uh, within the month of each other. Um, and I know that somehow or another, Leon and Ed are uh, measuring and leveling uh, somewhere up in heaven. But they're also realizing that the place they're at is a place built by the hands of God. And there's perfection there. It's better than being close enough for government work. It's God's work. And Ed had a way of looking at the world and seeing God's handiwork. And that's part of what he's left us with, the privilege of seeing that handiwork in our relationships, in the world around us, and in the church, churches that we serve. May God continue to bless uh, his daughter, Sarah, and just know what a wonderful man Ed Rian was. We're gonna miss him. Ed was one of the first people that I met when I came here to Wrightsboro back in January of 2016. And, and that's understandable because, as Pastor Bill said, he was always here. He was here for Sunday school and church. He was here pretty much whenever there was any type of a function. And he wasn't just here. He was active. He was participating. And I quickly learned that he was a very special person, a very good man in so many respects. And as I was praying about what I could say to you today, what I could share about Ed, just to let you know how special that he was, not just to me, but to you as well, how good he really was, one phrase kept coming into my mind, and that was that Ed was a person who loved. He loved so many things, and, and so I'm gonna reflect upon some of the things that, that we all know that Ed loved dearly to kind of tell you a little bit about him. I soon learned that Ed loved people. He genuinely loved people, and people loved him in return. He was one of the most easygoing people I have ever known. He always greeted me with a smile on his face and with a kind word, and I'm sure that wasn't just me, that was everyone that he met. I think Ed is one of those people that we can genuinely say never met a stranger. He had a way of making everyone feel special. And I never heard him say a harsh word to anyone, certainly not to me. 
and I never sensed that he was even upset about something. Well, there was that one time when we were in the kitchen on a Wednesday morning getting ready for breakfast. <laughs> no one else had gotten there yet, and, and Ed, you know, he was doing this and that, and he took the lid off the trash can, and somebody had put a large cardboard box in there. And Ed looked at it, and you could tell that it bothered him. And I remember exactly what he said. He said, if some people had a brain, they'd take it out and play with it. <laughs> now, the irony is that I put that box in there. <laughs> and I kept thinking, do I, do I tell him or do I not? You know, how do we handle this? And finally, I said, uh, Ed, I, I, I put that box in there. I, you know. I don't know that he believed me, but he just said, oh, and that was it. I wasn't chastised, but uh, anyway, that's about as close as I ever heard Ed uh, get upset about something, was about that cardboard box. Now, most of you know that before Ed retired, he was an insurance adjuster. And we talked about his work quite a bit, because when I was an attorney actively practicing back in the day, I worked with insurance adjusters all the time. So he and I could really have a conversation about what the job entailed and the challenges that it presented. But I learned that Ed was really good at his job, exceptional. He would tell me how his employer would send him all, all, all over the country, even out of the country, to handle the biggest and the most complicated cases. And even after he retired, he would still get calls occasionally to go somewhere and handle an exceptionally difficult case. And I asked him one time, I said, well, Ed, how is it that you became so successful as an adjuster? And he just said, well, I just treated people the way that I wanted to be treated, with kindness, with respect. Ed and I shared a love for good food both eating it and cooking it. He was a key volunteer in our Wednesday morning breakfast, and he was always there to cook the sausage and do whatever else he could to help out. And Ed had a special recipe for coleslaw. We know about his coleslaw, don't we? Absolutely. He was proud of that recipe, and I learned that if you wanted to make Ed's day, just ask him if he could make some coleslaw for whatever function we were having. He'd kind of pause and he'd kind of look off in the distance. He said, yeah, I can do that. How many people are you expecting? And I'd tell him, he said, okay, well, here's what I need. And he'd, you know, give me his list of ingredients that he needed, and I'd get it for him, and he'd make the arrangements to make it. But it gave him so much pleasure to cook and to serve others. After his beloved wife of 54 years passed, he sold their home and he moved into an apartment that was very near the home that Terry and I bought in preparation for my retirement. And I'd stop by every now and then to visit him, pretty regularly after I retired. And usually I would take him some of my almost famous clam chowder. And he would always have something for us. It may have been some Brunswick stew that he had made, or maybe a cake, or maybe cookies, brownies, whatever. But he loved to cook, and he loved to share what he had cooked with others as just a way of, of showing kindness, of love, his generosity. I continued to take him clam chowder when I could, especially when he went to the rehab facilities. And that seemed to make him especially happy. Because I remember one time, you know, Ed was not a complainer. But I remember the main thing that he complained about in those facilities was the food. I remember him telling me one time, they sure do know how to ruin a meal here. <laughs> so I think that the clam chowder may have been a particular blessing for him. And we all know that Ed loved his family. We know how much he loved his wife, of 54 years, Velna, and of course their daughter Sarah. 
Velna passed very tragically, unexpectedly, after I'd been here at Wrightsboro for only about four and a half months. So I really didn't get the opportunity to know her very well. But even in that short period of time that I would see them together, it was so obvious that they were deeply in love. I mean, in, in many ways, it was like they were newlyweds. They were always together. They were holding hands. It was just beautiful to watch. And after Vilna passed, Ed was devastated, of course. But he seemed to take it well. And I think that was because he knew that they would be re reunited someday, as they are now. And in fact, one of the last things that Ed said before he left this earth was that he was looking forward to being with Vilna again. And Sarah, he talked about you so often. Pretty much every time we visited, he would give me updates on your promotions, what you were doing, your travels, all that, whatever it was that you were up to. And he spoke with genuine pride about all of your accomplishments, the pride that only a father can have. And he told me so many times how thankful he was for the way that you stepped in and took over everything when he was unable to do it himself. Ed loved the Word of God. He studied it often on his own. And I knew that because sometimes he'd come to me and tell me about the devotion that he had read that morning. Whatever scripture he had been studying, he may have some comments or some questions. But I remember that when I first came here in 2016, I offered the disciple Bible studies. For those of you not familiar with that, it's what I call a serious Bible study. The class would meet once a week for two hours, and it would go for 34 or 36 weeks through the year. And there was homework in between the classes. And I offered all four of the Disciple Bible courses, beginning in 2016 until we had to quit due to COVID in 2020. And I share that with you just to make this point. Ed was in every one of those classes. And not only was he there, he was always prepared. And in fact, he had, as I recall, the best attendance record. Yes, I took attendance. He had the best attendance record of everyone in the class. One year, I remember, he had perfect attendance, and that was pretty amazing. He loved the Word of God, and Ed loved this church. As I said before, he was a faithful member. He was one who truly kept and honored his membership vows to support this church with his prayers, his presence, his gifts, his service, and his witness. I mentioned earlier that he was a key volunteer in our Wednesday breakfast. Many of you knew that. What you may not know is that Ed would come in about 30 to 45 minutes earlier than anyone else to get the kitchen in place, getting out the, the big steamers that kept the food hot while we were serving it. And when the church leadership had concerns about security during our worship services, Ed volunteered to sit out in the lobby during the worship services. He sat out there with his uh, air horn that we got him and a, I think a can of, of pepper spray just in case someone came in with uh, something other than worship on their minds, if you know what I mean. And a lot of people don't know that. And that's because Ed never looked for any type of attention. He wasn't looking for any type of, you know, pat on the back. Ed did what he could just for the glory of God and just to help people. But most importantly, Ed loved the Lord. In fact, I would say that all the other love that we saw flowing from Ed, as well as his many other good qualities, were really rooted in his love of the Lord. He treated people with kindness and respect and with love because that is what the Lord taught and expected him to do. And when Ed was going through difficult times, such as losing Velna or when his health was failing, Ed didn't complain except maybe about the food. And even when he knew his days on this earth were coming to an end, it showed no fear, none at all. 
He told me on several occasions that he wasn't in a hurry to leave this life. But he was ready to go whenever God called him home. He knew that God was with him, always with him, and that everything was going to be okay. And it is because Ed loved Jesus, because he put his whole trust in him, that, that we can gather here this morning and celebrate, even as we at the same time grieve. We celebrate the life he had here on this earth, a good, long life that touched and blessed so many others. But more importantly, we celebrate the new life that he is now enjoying. A life in that perfect place we know as heaven with loved ones, especially Velna. A place where there is no more pain, no more sickness, no more suffering, no more death. A place where he has received total healing and wholeness, both in body and in mind. A place of complete perfection and love in the presence of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We don't know all that goes on in heaven. We don't know everything there is to know about heaven. But one thing that we can be sure of is this. He is enjoying feasting at that heavenly banquet with friends and family who went on before him. That banquet hosted by none other than his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And who knows? He may be helping with the cooking and making coleslaw. So today and in the days to come, yes, we grieve the loss of Ed Wren. He will be missed by so many, along with all the love and the joy and the kindness that he shared. And let's remember, it's natural to grieve the loss of a loved one. That's what we do when we lose someone truly near and dear to us. It's the way that God designed us. But in the midst of our sorrow, let us also praise God. And let us rejoice for the victory that was won by Jesus Christ, the victory of eternal life, the victory that Ed claimed as his own through his love for and faith in Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. I believe Sarah would like to come up and say a few words about her dad. Good morning, everyone. So, um, there is a Sherwin-Williams paint store on Carr Avenue near the intersection with Market Street. I don't remember the name of the shopping center. One evening in the mid to late 1980s when I was a teenager, my dad drove up to the front of this store with me, pointed to the sign, and asked me what I saw. And I said, I see a sign about paint. He said, no, it's communism. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't remember, the Sherwin-Williams paint sign consists of a bucket of red paint uh, being poured over a globe. Um, there's SWP on the bucket of paint, and underneath it says, cover the earth. Okay. Um, Dad explained to me that SWP stands for Socialist Workers Party um, and that the communists who were really, or the, sorry, and that the socialists who were really just communists were planning to take over the world, so watch out. <laughs> then we know, drove home and never spoke of this again. <laughs> and to this day, I have no idea whether or not he was just putting me on. <laughs> I, I re what was that about? Was it just another chapter in the long, long book of all the things my dad did to make sure I could take care of myself, whether making the sacrifices that it took to make sure that I could get the education I wanted at Duke and beyond, um, whether it was showing me how to use a miter saw, how to measure, um, both with building things and in the kitchen, um, checking the oil in my car, making cheese straws, or balancing a checkbook. Was it, was it part of that whole story, or was he just pulling my leg? 
I'll never know for sure. And in some ways, parents and children will always be mysteries to one another. As close as you are, there's always going to be some mystery there. And one of the things I came to appreciate over the last year of my dad's life was that he was so much more than just my dad. Although, believe me, he inhabited the role of being my dad to the fullest. Um, He lived a big life. And today, we're going to hear from people who can share parts of my dad's story that I don't even know about. I've, I've heard from some of you that I know will be following me up here, and I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity that I have now, though, to share with you some of what I do know. This is one of the things that I, I didn't find out until I was probably in my late 20s, early 30s, but um, my dad basically told me that he didn't really learn to read until he was in college. His childhood was wonderful. He loved growing up in the Duke Power Village at Cedar Creek. He was loved. He, you know, he always looked back on his childhood with, with great joy and, and appreciation. But his education up until college was kind of lacking. And actually, it's remarkable that he even took it into his head that that was something he should go do. Um, So he was educated in a one-room schoolhouse and then Lancaster High School, but he felt he didn't really learn how to read until he got to college, was taken under the wing of the football coach at Presbyterian College. He he was not a player. He was team manager. But um, this is some of where his great love of ACC sports came, and encyclopedic knowledge of ACC sports came from, and um, his econ professor, he was an economics major, may not surprise some of you, he was good with the figures, um, who really took him under their wing and enabled him to develop the talents to grow intellectually and become the voracious reader and seeker of knowledge and studier. He was a studier that he became and remained for his entire life. Um, And I pull this out to tell you because I think, one, it's a testament to my dad's persistence and positive thinking uh, and lifelong love of learning, which he gave to me, which is kind of how I ended up in academia, for better or worse. Um, Right now it's for better. Uh, But I think that being underestimated as a child, because you see, One of the reasons that he didn't really learn to read very well in his early education was he needed glasses, and no one figured that out until he was about nine or ten years old. So he just thought everybody else was seeing the same blur that he saw on the blackboard or in the books and that they could make sense out of it, and he couldn't. So it took him a while to catch up, but catch up he did. And... um, course his sister was a straight A student from the get-go so as much as my dad was loved and valued and had a wonderful childhood in a lot of ways people underestimated him and instead of taking this as a reason to lack in self-confidence or gumption my dad turned it into a superpower he was able to put people at ease Uh, Sometimes he even craftily encouraged them to underestimate him, maybe a little more than they should have, which made him a formidable insurance adjuster. But he was also fair. He was never afraid to tell the higher-ups when they just needed to cut to the chase and pay that claim and take care of those people. Um, But yeah, my dad took being underestimated, and instead of taking that as as evidence he should think less of himself, he ran with it. And um, this is why I so love the picture that is before you on the altar today. I had chosen another one. I had sent it into Alpha Graphics to have it printed, um, you know, uh, on the on the poster that you'll see later. I think it's in the fellowship hall. And then I saw the picture that David had selected 
for the, the bulletin. And I was like, no, it has to be. I called them back. I'm like, stop the presses. It has to be this picture. I want y'all to all see this picture because I think it shows some truth about my dad that might not have always been obvious in your every, everyday interactions with him. I think this photo shows my dad as a quiet intellect marked by humor and intellect that I didn't really appreciate until well into my adulthood, because that's how long it took me to figure out I wasn't the smartest person in the room. In, in case anybody's wondering, that was my mother. <laughs> anyway, um, he was handsome too. He was a handsome guy, look at those blue eyes. My mother so loved his blue eyes, and that's the other thing about this photo, you can see those eyes and all their glory. Um, but it was the humor and kindness that captured my mother's heart. Their first date was a double date with her cousin Marie um, to the Arthur Murray Dance Studio in what was then Cameron Village in Raleigh. Um, and um, being a fair but not outstanding dancer, uh, my dad decided to play the fool instead. So he did his you know, country bumpkin, this is how you dance kind of routine, and she immediately saw through it because she was nobody's fool, but she appreciated the effort, um, and um, it worked. They were married within the year. Mm -hmm. Within the year. So let's see, we're going from section three to section four, okay, to section five. My mother saved the cards from all the flowers that he sent her during their courtship, and she made a collage with these cards and dried flowers that still hangs in my dining room, right above where I work, so whenever I'm on a Zoom call, it's right there in the background. I get to see it. Um, and she kept a log of all their dates and what they went and what kind of flowers he got her. And I still have that as well. Um, they were truly in love for all the years of their marriage and truly, truly partners. Now, in the vestibule and in the fellowship hall, you will see uh, the fruits, a couple of the fruits of their many, many collaborations. Uh, there is a lamp, a birdhouse lamp. My dad would build the birdhouses and wire the lamps. My mother would use her artistic eye to decorate them. So you'll get to see that. There's also a little house built for a Project Warm fundraiser. I think it was a table decoration. You know, just a little thing. But one of the things that my dad insisted follow him everywhere he went, from when they downsized their house to his apartment, from when he downsized from that apartment to assisted living, it followed him everywhere. And it's, it's right out there in the vestibule today. Um, so um, they were truly a partnership. And just full disclosure, uh, I didn't cry at my mother's funeral. I didn't cry at the hospital. I came close to tears a couple times. To probably the closest I came was when David Ray came to my mother's funeral and I was holding it together and he walked in the door and I saw him and I burst out crying and dug on it, David, you've done it again. You just, anyway, um, I didn't cry because to me, she wasn't gone as long as my dad was still here. So now I find myself mourning two parents and just, they are both intermingled in the urn you see before you today together again forever. But yeah, um, I was so proud of how my dad carried on after my mother died. He missed her every day for the rest of his life. He told me this. And you know, we're not, we're wrens. We, we, keep, it, we keep it under wraps. We, we, we're not big on you know, public displays of, of grief. Uh, we tell each other we love each other a lot, but a lot of the other stuff goes on unsaid, but no, he could not hold that in. He told me often how much he missed my mother. So I was so proud of how he carried on. He remained positive 
and open to life's possibilities. But he didn't do that by himself. Um, he did not do that alone. As strong as he was, it was the love and friendship that all of you provided him, that empowered him to live on as a happy man. Even after my mother's death, I can say that my dad was a happy man. Even during the last often difficult year of his life, my dad was happy. As much as I miss him, and I do, my grief is assuaged by the gratitude I feel for the people who called him, the people who wrote cards, um, the people who visited him faithfully from when he was in the hospital to the first care facility to the second care facility to when I finally got him to a care facility that truly cared for him the way he deserved to be taken care of. Those of you who stuck with him along this difficult road, um, you enabled my father to be a happy man to the end of his days. And let me tell you, my dad loved his friends and family. He loved living, and he did not want to leave you or leave this life. But he was not afraid to go. He was not afraid to go. Um, so I want to close by thanking the many people who enabled my dad to keep his dignity and joy in living as his body failed him. Family, you know, church family, blood relations, people he just chose to bring into his family. I myself am adopted, and I know there are people in this room that my dad looked on as family, and uh, being an adopted person, I, I got a kind of flexible concept of what it means to be family, and, um, and both the blood ties and the ties of the heart are important are important, which is why we have some folks up here sitting in the family section who aren't technically blood relations, but that's okay. You are all family, and I must apologize to the people in this room because I don't know you all. I'm sure there are other people who my dad thought of as family, too. Like I said, he led a big life, and, and I didn't know all of it. I, I look forward to hearing from you. So, yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, you know, church family, Cedar Creek family, um, and then the caregivers and the hospice workers. Um, these are the folks who you know, made a huge contribution to making my dad's last days you know, worth living, to taking away the suffering, to keeping him in dignity. Um, they did this with love and dedication, and they became his true friends. Um, they took away my worries and fears. I could not have stepped in and managed my dad's affairs without, you know, there were so many things I had to worry about until I finally got him into a place where he had the team around him that he needed and deserved. I would not have made it through this year in one piece. I would not have been able to support my dad and be there for him the way that he needed me without all of these folks. So, you know, whether we're talking about, like I said, the friends and family who were there with him and visited him, or members of this caregiving team, uh, I cannot express my gratitude um, for taking away my worries and fears and giving me the strength to be present for my dad. That was a gift I will spend the rest of my life trying to repay. And if I may ask you, to honor my dad in any particular way other than obviously donating to NC Warm, the organization that he served for many years uh, with great joy. Um, I would like to ask that you do what you can with what gifts you have to support the caregivers, whether they be family members like Cindy Show and Debbie Stagall working to support an aging parent tirelessly, you know, with great love 
and dedication, or whether they be people who earn their living caring for the aged and the infirm. I feel that as a society, we, we, we don't appreciate these people as we should. They're often forgotten or taken for granted when they should be celebrated, respected, and compensated as benefits the value of the work and the sacrifices that, that these people make. You know, the time taken away from their families to make sure that my dad was gonna be okay. So I'm not gonna tell you how to do it. Do you write a letter to a congressman? Do you write a letter to, an, to the editor? Do you find a charity that you can donate to? Um, do you, you know, question people running for office about how they're going to help make sure that you know, we have a health care system that supports people with dignity in their final days and allows the people who are taking care of them to earn you know, not just a living wage, but a wage that allows them to live their lives and care for their own families. Um, there are more ways to honor my dad than I could list. I'm sure some of you already have in mind things that you can do that, that I've never thought of. Um, but yeah, if there is a way to um, honor my dad's life, I would like to ask that, that you do this. Thank you all so much for being here today. As Sarah alluded to, she would like to give uh, anyone that feels so led the opportunity to come up and share a, a memory or whatever's on your mind about Ed. Do you need to come up here because we're on camera? <laughs> come on, Brad. For a lot of you folks that don't know me, and I'm, <clears throat> my name's Bradshaw. I have a lot of words to say a lot of the time, and a lot of people can't hush me up. But today, if I get quiet, just understand that my heart is with D and uh, will always be with Ed. Um, when Ed passed away, I promised Dee that I would come up and speak. I always try to keep my word like Ed always kept his word. Um, there's no way I can top what Preacher Bill or Pastor David said about Ed Wren today. There's no way. Because everything they said was absolutely true. But it's like they alluded to there are many, many, many stories that folks just don't understand about Ed Wren. I lost my father and mother, and my um, dad passed in 04, and mom in 08. And uh, Ed Wren was one of the first folks to come to my side. He says, Brad, he says, I know it's hard. He says, but you're gonna be okay. He says, and I'm going to be here with you. And at that time, you just don't understand what that means to know that you've got somebody walking with you and sharing your grief. Ed was such a man as everything that you have heard these folks say today. One thing I want to remind you of in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 13, and I'm not real good at quoting scripture, but faith, hope, and love. And of these, love is the greatest. Ed Wren portrayed that better than any person I think I've ever known. He was all about love. And it's like Pastor David said, you never heard Ed Wren complain about anything. But I guarantee you, Ed Wren was the first one there if anybody needed any help. Um, I'm telling my age a little bit and don't want to embarrass my wife, but 
Ed has been a part of our family for so, so many years that people just didn't realize it. He always called Cindy <clears throat> my little Cindy because Ed and Velna used to go to Wrightsville Beach Methodist Church. And when Cindy was a little girl, what, four or five years old? Uh, and still, please forgive me for saying this, uh, like to talk a lot. <laughs> and uh, when it came time to church time, Ed and Velna, as usual, were there every week. And then here little Cindy would come running. And I don't want to steal your thunder, Cindy. I really don't. But that's the first thing that Cindy told me about Ed. And Ed reflected and he said, yeah, well, I had to do what I had to do. But little Cindy running around, yak, 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 yak. And Ed would say, Cindy, this is not the place or the time. And uh, Cindy would tell me these stories. But, you know, when Cindy and I first were married back in uh, the early 80s. How what that is right, correct? <laughs> uh, we were part of Wrightsville Beach Methodist, and that's when I first became to know Ed. And uh, many years later, when we walked through this door, and Ed was a part of this church, he was a huge reason of why Cindy and I chose to come to this church. And uh, it's like Pastor David said, I often found pleasure in asking him to do his coleslaw. You know, we would have chicken dinners and barbecue dinners and so forth. And Ed loved to, uh, he loved to cook and he loved, he loved to help other people. And, and he never, ever, ever said no. I don't ever remember Ed Wren declining anything when it came to anything in this church. Um, but Ed was a man of faith, and it's like Pastor David said, I participated, we participated in those disciple Bible classes. And with Ed sitting there with his perfect attendance and, and being prepared, like Dee said, Ed shared his knowledge and taught me quite a bit. Embarrassingly enough, if I was too embarrassed to ask Pastor David, what does this mean? Ed would always grab me to the side and he said, well, let me try to explain this to you. So those are the small, tiny things that Ed Wren did. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm like Pastor David. I'm happy he's with Velna. Um, I don't want to be selfish. I'm going to miss Ed. My family's going to miss Ed. He took my son, talked to him several times, and my grandchildren loved, loved, loved Ed. And D, I'm not stepping on your toes by any means, but Ed thought of my grandchildren as his grandchildren. And Ben and Maddie thought the same. Call him Pop Pop. And I know they're going to miss him. But Ben and Maddie, I want you to understand, that's why we have you in church. That's why we ask you to say the blessings at meals is because Mr. Ed and everyone in this church loves Jesus. But he's home with Jesus and Velna now. And he... He's smiling down upon you, and I want you to always remember Mr. Ed, okay? Okay? He loved all of you. I love all of you, and thank you for putting up with, with me today. Thank you. Would someone else like to share? Well, remember that we're going to have a time of fellowship uh, following the service with lots of good food, and you'll have an opportunity to, to share your stories. Maybe you're not comfortable coming up here and sharing with everybody. Yep. But certainly you'll have the opportunity to share them with Sarah and just to remember Ed and, and tell the stories that we all have about him. But thank you all for sharing.
friends as um, Pastor David and Brad and Sarah have um, already said, you know, Mr. Ed, that's how I knew him, Mr. Ed. Um, Mr. Ed loved the Lord, and my honor today is to tell you a little bit about the Lord that he loved and the gospel that he held on to so tightly. If there's a chapter of scripture that I could say, if you only had to read one to synthesize the whole gospel into one place, it would be Romans chapter 8. And so I'm going to share some of these words from the Apostle Paul. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. We know that all things work together for the good For those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. These words that I just read to you from the Apostle Paul are arguably some of the most critical words in the entire New Testament and the entire Bible. They're found right in the middle of Paul's great letter to the Romans, chapter 8, a letter that he wrote just a few years shy of his own death when he was thinking about his own mortality and what would come next. In this letter, Paul spends a great deal of time reflecting on three things, sin, the grace of God, and the responsibility of the church. And one of the reasons why this particular letter has always been so meaningful to me is because of how Paul talks about sin in the first place. The first four chapters of the letter, he gives us time and time again, reason after another, why humans do not deserve the grace of God. The big idea in these chapters is that sin is not what we do. We often mess that up in the church. It's like if I stub my toe and say a bad word, I sin. But that's not really what sin is. We're not sin because of what we do. Sin is our nature. Sin is the reality of a broken and fallen world. That's one of the ways that the church strives to answer the question of, why doesn't everything feel like it is as it should be? Why is life hard sometimes? Why do we have to deal with grief and sorrow and death and sickness and illness and tragedy? It's because of brokenness. It's because of sin. And yet the power of the gospel is that Jesus didn't come to save us from a list of actions. Jesus came to save us from ourselves. He came to save us from our nature. That's why Paul in another letter says, Jesus became sin even though he knew no sin, so that we might be the righteousness of God. 
So in these moments where we experience grief and loss, it's important that we reflect on the reality of a broken world. It hurts when we lose the ones we love. We grieve it. We feel it. It hurts in one way because it's not part of God's perfect design. This isn't how it was supposed to be. But the good news is that for those who belong to Christ, there is an enduring hope. A hope that death does not have the last word. And Ed knew this hope. One of my last conversations with him was in the hospital. I had the opportunity to be there. It was just he and I in the room. And I leaned over to him and I said, Ed, I really want to pray for you. And I want to know how I can specifically pray for you in this moment. Because it was clear that Ed understood that things were transitioning. And he looked at me and he said, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to be with Velna. I'm ready to see Jesus. And I just pray that it would be peaceful. And so I held his hand. And I leaned in, and I prayed for him. And I asked that God would make this journey peaceful. And I told him that I believed that when it was time, Jesus would be there to bring him home. Because that's what Jesus tells the disciples. He says, I'm getting your place ready for you. And when it's ready, I'm going to come and lead you there. About a week after that, I had the opportunity to sit with Sarah and with Cindy in Ed's room. And I had the chance to listen to him as he was breathing and place my hand on his arm and say another prayer. I also had the wonderful opportunity to hear Cindy and Sarah reflect so much about Ed's life. And I considered that a great honor because I didn't get to know Ed the same way that um, many did. We gather, we grieve, we mourn, we shrink before the mystery of death, as the prayer that David prayed earlier in the service said, but we also cling tightly to a word of hope, that in these final moments, Ed left this temporary place to be with his Savior forever, and nothing was going to get in his way. That's like the big bad wolf in the letter to the Romans is nothing. Nothing. If God is for us, who can be against us? Nothing. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. What can break our hope, even in terrible darkness? Nothing. Nothing. Paul writes, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. I grieve, I mourn, and I give God thanks that this glory has been revealed to precious Ed. And I'm thankful that the same glory revealed to Ed is the glory available to us as well. And I pray that in this moment that each of us would find comfort in this message, in this gospel that Ed held on to so closely. And I pray that we would put our trust in Christ and in his grace and give thanks that the promise of resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. The worst thing is never the last thing. All praise and honor, honor and glory to God. Amen. This life is done, your new one's begun. I see you kneeling at the throne of grace, gazing on Jesus' face. The angels sing. The
the trumpet sound everyone gathers around oh i i can just see you now oh i i can just Rejoicing with family and friends in heaven, where joy never ends. Oh, I, I can just see you now. As we shed endless tears, celebrate your years. You know you'll always have a special place in our hearts. Now there's no more sorrow, no more pain. You'll welcome. Rejoicing with family and friends in heaven, where joy never ends. Oh, I, I can just see us now, even though we didn't want you to go. You're in a better place, I know. Crystal mansions, streets of gold, so much beauty to behold. Oh, I, I can just see us now. Rejoicing with family and friends in heaven where joy never ends. Oh, I, I can just see you now. Oh, I, I can just see you Thank you, Amanda and Sylvia. I invite you to pray with me. God of us all, your love never ends. When all else fails, you still are God. We pray to you for one another in our time of need and for all anywhere who mourn with us this day. To those who doubt, give light. To those who are weak, strength. To all who have sinned, mercy to all who sorrow your peace keep true in us the love with which we hold one another in all our ways we trust you 
And to you, with your church on earth and in heaven, we offer honor and glory now and forever. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive Ed into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints of light. God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us even to this day, for the gift of joy and days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and for friends and for our baptism and place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. And above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for us. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer that our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Almighty God, into your hands we commend your son, Ed Wren, in sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This body we commit to its resting place, Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. Amen. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn, I'll Fly Away, and let's sing it like we mean it. Friends, in a moment, I'm going to offer a benediction. Um, when I do, we're going to invite the family to head on into the fellowship hall. There is, there's a reception there. Everyone's invited to go to the fellowship hall. There's finger foods. There's seating around the fellowship hall, and you're welcome to um, visit and fellowship with each other and with the family as well. I'll ask for everyone to wait until the family is left, and then um, the rest can be dismissed.
Friends, now may the God of peace, who brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, covenant make you complete in everything good, so that you may do his will, working among us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, let me offer a blessing for the food. Almighty God, we give you thanks for this food that we are about to eat. We thank you so much for the hands that have prepared it. So many have come together to provide this meal for us for this time of fellowship so that we might continue to remember and rejoice and celebrate the life of our dearly beloved Ed. A friend, we pray that you would bless this food to nourish our bodies so that we may serve you. And we pray that you would bless our conversation and our time together. Amen. Amen, friends. Go in peace. Thank you.